Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone from all parts of the world who have registered for the webinar which we are having today. Hope you, you and your family are doing safe in COVID times. Our best wishes are with all of you. Now to begin with, let me introduce myself and the company to you. My name is Nitin Naveen and I'm Vice President Innovation Strategy at AI Core Spot. I'll be your host for the day. Further, I have been joined by my colleague Arvind and Naveen, who will also assist me in keeping the event lively and resolving technical glitches if it comes in between. So thanks a lot to them for putting in hard work and making this one a huge success. Provide a seamless experience to all of you so that you can gain maximum output out of the session. From AI Core Spot Front, let me provide a small introduction. We started last year and we are gaining momentum. Our aim is to be number one AI-driven community all over the world so that like-minded people like you can be part of the same in supporting, growing, and making it a good, huge success. Our mission is to serve as a hub for information regarding Industry 4.0 technologies, which includes AI, machine learning, deep learning, robotics, blockchain, IoT, edge computing, analytics, 5G, drone, edge AI, digital twin, AR, VR, cloud, and so on. We'll continue to do industry-backed webinars and hybrid events. The knowledge repository will be made from reliable data through industry leaders, subject matter experts, and the thought leaders. We'll enrich the content through various mediums we have, like videos, blogs, podcasts, newsletter, digital content, to shed light on the ever-evolving industry. So request all of you to go through our website from where you have registered as well, that is aicorespot.io, for future updates. Also, please like us media handles, which will keep you all updated on everything what we propose to offer in the coming months. There's a similar event that is the role of AI within the banking sector, which is happening on Feb 25th, where we have 12 great leaders sharing their thoughts. So kindly attend that event too. There are a lot more in store for subsequent months as well with focus on technology in retail, e-commerce, factory, manufacturing, aviation, and so on. So request all of you to keep connected with us and enjoy the learning. Now coming to today's event. Today is the great event that the webinar happened and how AI is the grand differentiator and change maker in the banking sector. Before starting with the day, I would like to highlight a few things so that it can set up the tone for the amazing learning and networking day. A special mention to our technology partner, that is Digit7, who has helped us in understanding our vision and supporting us to create a platform like this through which we can help achieve our objectives. Their support is immense and guidance is important. So about Digit7 to everyone so that they are, you all are aware of them. Inter innovation is the corner store of Digit7. At, at Digit7, they create unique customer experiences and value-driven solutions. Their solutions are designed to solve real-time problems and are customizable to suit anyone's business. Adding to that, the products which they have can scale up at ease as your business grows. Further, their associations with trusted brands such as AWS, Microsoft Azure, IBM, My, SA, uh, SaaS, Adobe, Salesforce, Sterling Commerce, amongst many others, help them constantly upskill practitioners and champion the partner's best delivery methodologies. Professionally, they are closely associated with several bodies like Tech Titans, Forbes Technology Council, CompTIA, Richardson IQ, University of Texas, and many more technology brain power to leverage their contrasting standpoints and diverse skill sets. They have four great products, which includes Digit7 Z Store, Digit7 Digit Shelves, Digit7 Tag Square, and Digit7 Fly Robo. So all are unique products, and you all can go through their website, that is digit7.io, and understand more in depth. Also, thanks to all our community partners for today, which includes InfoVision, Paysend, Canopy, Home Trust, Patriot Software, Ally, and STS Cap Capital Partners, who came together to make this event a success. A special mention to speakers and attendees of the event who registered and came today to achieve their objectives through this forum. At the end of the day, if you gain few knowledge-driven tips out of this, or get to network with each other, then our core objectives will be achieved. Further, if anyone wants to ask questions, they can type in the Q&A section, which is there at the right side of the menu option. You can type in as and when the panel member discusses, and we'll try to get it answered during the discussion. 
or if you want to write it you can write it at end of the uh, end of the panel discussion as per the time permitted we can get we can discuss it there's also a hand button which is visible to all of you at the bottom of the screen through which you can even raise the hand and come to the stage to ask questions to speakers as well and you will be visible with your video on so uh, about the about the panel discussion which is happening today i'll hand over the stage to jairo who is from pacent and is the moderator of the panel discussion along with great leaders like john sania paul ling and captain who are the speakers for today and the thought leaders so that they can all take the panel discussion forward so over to you jairo thank you very much nitin and welcome everyone i'm hairo riveros from pacent At Paysend, we've been focusing on reducing time, cost, and friction about the cross-border payments. We're here to talk about AI and AI in banking, and I wanted to start by just bringing a definition of AI. Artificial intelligence is the intelligence demonstrated by machines, as opposed to the natural intelligence which is displayed by animals, including humans like ourselves. I would like to introduce our panel. I'm going to ask them to please say a few words about you and where you're coming from. Let's start with John. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. John Levenick, um, CEO of Canopy Financial Technology Partners. Um, we're a company that focuses in assisting uh, retail and capital market banking clients in the digitalization of consumer finance processes. Um, we leverage emerging technology to conduct traditional services uh, on behalf of clients um, to facilitate, you know, better and cleaner access to credit uh, for all parties. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Ling. Sure. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, current. Um, I have done data science for a while. I started with actually analytics before data science is current. Uh, currently, I'm uh, doing leading a data science team. Basically, I have many focus. Basically, how to use data science drive more business values and basically empower uh, data informed decision. Uh, accelerate business growth and drive operation excellence. So basically, I'm happy to join today. Uh, maybe I focus mainly in the customer journey. Uh, so look forward to get uh, the questions, have a real good discussion with everyone. Thank you. Excellent, Lee. Great to have a data scientist with us today. Uh, Sanja. Thank you. Yes, my name is Sonia Kankar Todorovic. I head up the enterprise procurement, outsourcing, and vendor management here at Home Trust, uh, based out of uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Happy to be here in a great Excellent. company. Excellent. Uh, I am also in Canada today, so we're both uh, from Canada reporting today. Uh, Paul? Thank you. My name is Paul Jusson. I work with uh, Patriot Software. We're an accounting and payroll service provider, uh, cloud-based services based out of Canton, Ohio. Uh, it's a little cold this time of year, but uh, we're making it. The uh, I'm in-house corporate counsel banking. Uh, I also serve as a member of the advisory board for uh, NACHA, uh, and I'm very passionate about fraud. Uh, and so uh, as we talk, as our company kind of sits on a uh, kind of wall between consumers, business accounts, uh, data, and all kinds of things. Uh, I'm excited to be part of this conversation uh, and where we'll go today. Thank you, Paul. Excellent. And last but not least, Kimball. Kempton. Me? Kempton? Oh, yeah. my name is Kempton. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I specialize in Uh, utilizing artificial intelligence as an ingredient in helping owners monetize their life's work or multi-generational life work uh, with regard to the exit process of shareholders whenever they're ready to 
actually go through the journey, not only from a uh, what I would say is a therapeutic standpoint, but also from an executive coaching standpoint, and then ultimately into the exit of their business from a monetization standpoint. So honored to be here, and artificial intelligence is critical in every component of what we do. Excellent. Thank you, Kenton, and uh, thank you, everyone. As you can see, we have an excellent panel uh, to lead us to a good discussion today. Feel free to post your questions in the Q&A and also in the discussion, and we will try to answer them as we go. Before we open for some conversation, I would like to bring some context into what we think about machine intelligence. We see it every day in applications like Google when we are trying to search for something, or in recommendations like Netflix will do for us, a human speech when we call Alexa uh, for different instructions, self-driving if you have a Tesla or a like, and uh, decision-making, especially on the gaming application. Um, I was trying to uh, research what have been some of the breakthroughs that we have seen in artificial intelligence lately, aside from banking as will be part of our discussion. And there are a few things that call my interest. Machines are now better than humans in learning from experience. We see that in gaming. They are beating us in every game application where they try to learn from the experience of playing over over a time, a hundred times, million of times, uh, 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 nonstop. They are better than humans in classifying images. This is face recognition. They do it faster. They do it more wisely. They just go into the uh, identification with very limited uh, error at this moment. They are better than radiologists, and my excuses if anybody is here a doctor, are reading images. But that doesn't mean that they can recommend something, but still they are better at reading the images. And they are now better than humans at communicating. I think all probably in this audience have seen the Google call to make an appointment to a hairdresser, which basically imitates a human to a very large extent. But why this has happened? There are a couple of things that have come that I will refer to as we go. One is big data. It has helped a lot in fueling the artificial intelligence. Faster processing, our computers are handling way more data that they can do on calculations before. Open source frameworks, we can communicate among each other. And data scientists, like we have with Lingnan at this moment, all these have done. But what about banking? Let's frame what banking has mean. From the first ATM installed in 1960 to today, there's been a lot of progress. It's just less than 50 years, so a little more than 50, but there has been a lot of progress. And there are a number of examples. The first one is mobile banking. Today's world, you can say, Alexa, send $20 to Alex, and I can confirm the transaction with my finger ID. Or child bolts, who can communicate with the customers, and you can ask for your balance, you can ask for a transfer between accounts, with little interaction or none from an employee at the bank. I would like to call on Paul at this moment from Patrick Software to tell us about your thoughts on how IT and IT projects are influencing AI on banking. Paul. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'd also like to add something to your list of what AI has become better at, uh, and that is philosophy. And I go back to Descartes in the 1600s, who asked, uh, how do I know I exist? Uh, how do I know other people exist? And I can tell you that AI is better at establishing an identity, real or wrong, than any human being. Uh, we saw it just a few months ago. We had, a, uh, we had somebody who was, uh, must have been very intelligent create a bot. They scraped the dark web for 1,700 identifications. They very quickly set up 1,700 corresponding bank accounts, and then they actually came through our setup wizard and attempted to set up 700 accounts to be able to move money through that banking. Traditionally, this wouldn't happen, right? Uh, when I grew up, I had a small credit union. We knew everybody. I could call them on the phone, ask them to wire money, and they knew myself. They knew my voice. Uh, and honestly, in, in many ways, that is the absolute best of identity verifications. Now we're in an environment, employers are, employers are sending checks to employees they've never even met in person and never will, uh, possibly never even talked on the phone. We're operating at banks with people that we've never met. 
Uh, and still we go back to uh, the question that I think has been asked by philosophy from the beginning. And that is, how do we know who somebody is? How do we even know who I am? Uh, and there's many approaches to try to detail this out. I think AI is one of the forefronts of this and trying to assemble uh, historical and contemporaneous records of an individual to try to establish that, okay, this person has enough consistent information of what we know about this person to believe they are who they say they are. Uh, ultimately, though, as we have to use more and more of this information to try to identify ourselves, to try to create the online identification, uh, in some ways, who we are becomes a very separate individual persona online in some sense mm -hmm. uh, that, that anybody can step into the shoes of and use uh, to transfer financial assets for, for good and bad. I think we're all excited about some of the convenience uh, that fintech world has brought to the traditional banking world. It's, it's wonderful to be able to move money quickly. The other side of it, though, is nobody wants to lose their money. And we've begun to see a huge divide between how the United States, at least, is treating business accounts versus consumer accounts. Business accounts are treated more as a contract between the people moving money. Consumer accounts are more dominated by regulations that are kind of protecting that consumer. So a consumer can have money taken and very quickly be indemnified by the bank. But businesses, that's rarely the case. And businesses are traditionally much more public, uh, inherently so, than individuals, uh, because they're doing business with the public. So as we kind of talk about AI, how it is used, uh, how we can try to identify people safely, securely, move money, ultimately in real time is what everybody wants. Uh, and we want finality while still maintaining uh, a security that allows that transaction to have integrity. Uh, so this is this is something we're seeing everywhere, I think. In many ways, I call it the, the Wild West of fintech. Uh, and we're wrestling with how to create these rules, how to uh, know our customer or know our customer good enough to be able to rely on that. Uh, and it's, it's just such an exciting and interesting time. Uh, I just I just can't express enough energy for it. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Well, I do represent Pace and Fintech. So in a way, we do understand exactly what you're talking about. Uh, for us, there are a couple of elements that are crucial, and is financial inclusion and financial education, two elements that have to become hand-to-hand -to, -hand to be able to bring the best experience. And this is an excellent segue uh, to talk about another element, which is data collection and analysis. And no one better than our science uh, who is in the room. Because as you just mentioned, in the past, the approach was a claim came to a meeting, meet a bank employee. They know each other by name, their financial history, and understood what better options to offer. That is not happening in that sense anymore. So uh, maybe, Link, could you tell us a little bit about your view on leveraging data for the customer experience uh, and your, your uh uh, data science, what can we expect in banking in this respect? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I think uh, this comes uh, customer experience and I really want to start as a customer for myself uh, to discuss this problem. Uh, I really want to share uh, my personal experience as a customer it really happens most recently, and maybe two weeks ago, when I tried to call a financial company, I tried to understand, do something, I, I don't tell you specifically right now, when I pick the phone, it's automatic voice system, and they said, if you have a login problem, plus one, if you want to know your balance, account balance, plus two, and also... It's going on a long list, finally others. So I uh, push the button others. Then they said, do you have a pin? I said, no. Then they said, okay, we will send a pin as a phone uh, uh, to your phone. Then I got the pin and I entered the pin. Then they said, goodbye. <laughs> also, also, this is not solve my problem. Then I call back, the whole process repeated again. So what I mean here, 
um, I currently we we do use AI in certain level actually. We based on some predefined process workflow, but uh, even such as an employee go to a bank and talk with a, a bank employee, they also know the some historical information for a specific client, but they really don't know what's the happening most recently. The historical data is really, really limited. The service actually, uh, the client, what happening right now? What's the intention of a customer? Whether through a phone or through go to directly go to the office talk with a bank employee. That means, first thing from data collection perspective, we do need to broaden not only in the from history how much we already have. We should also look forward and what's the intent a customer want to do. Another thing is we need to leverage more broader knowledge, such as when do a phone conversation or even from face-to-face -face conversation, what's the customer's sentiment during this conversation? So this is all count a customer experience. So now I want to switch the role actually as um, a data science professional, how we are going to basically design a personalized customer experience, make the flow pretty ideal. Because ultimately, girl, we try to basically make the customer life easier not follow their pre-designed workflow. They think the customer should follow. Instead, we need to understand such as what's the shortest path for a specific customer to serve them. Uh, so definitely when I do this, I really feel frustrated and my voice raised when I call the phone, how I hope the, the, the other side can say, oh, it sounds you are frustrated. Maybe this is not right away. So I, I want to hear that kind of stuff. Maybe it wrote me to a better option. And that's something I want. I think the AI should serve in this area. And the second part, I also want to talk about the traditional concept, how to uh, optimize a customer's maximum a customer's life journey, even for other non-bank, same thing. But especially for the bank, I'm thinking basically, as to this concept uh, should change, we should think about how to maximize a business value for a customer by serving them well. Uh, the reason is I say that each customer we should treat differently. We want their, their life to become better. We want they get maximum. In this way, I don't think a bank will lose anything. Basically, you, you basically make your reputation, your brand make much better. I really like one sentence. I think is. Uh, Jim Ron said, success is really not about uh, how much you pursue. Instead, uh, it's really what you attract because of the person you become. I think for a bank, it's the same thing. If we have a really excellent customer experience, your, your reputation become well-known, so excellent, you attract much, much more customer to maximum your profit. Instead, only focus a single customer, maximum your own profit. The base will change. So that's the area I think we use leverage AI data science, make your business, drive your, optimize your product service, and also optimize the customer experience, eventually optimize your business profit. That's what I want to talk.
Thank you so much, Lynn. Excellent comments. Uh, we really appreciate it. Let me ask uh, my colleagues, how many of you, raise your hand, have a data science in your organizations? Three of us, well, four, four, five. Uh, well, almost, almost, John is almost on it. Now, it's quite interesting. It's kind of a new uh, field in many ways, although it hasn't been that new. Uh, as I mentioned before, since 1960, we have actually had the definition of AI in many different ways. Do any one of you would like to share a different point of view about how you use the analytics on this? Please. I would like to share a story. Please. So I'm sitting in San Diego, California, and a gentleman has reached out to me and he says simply this. We have changed the way that the customer service experience is happening through artificial intelligence. My three partners and I are ready to monetize that life's work. I said, what do you mean? And he says, what we do is we flip what has traditionally been an expense on the balance sheet with regard to providing customer service. And we have used AI to do two things. And this is pre-COVID. They, did, they, they started this pre-COVID we will absorb all of the information that is available to us from the customer data whenever that touch point comes in. So expecting that most of us on this phone call are in North America, maybe this jacket has a flaw and I need to call the company and ask them to replace it. They have no idea how many other jackets like this I've purchased. Maybe they do. And then instead of waiting on hold for a long time, they've taken artificial intelligence and understood the buying patterns of the person that called in because that's already an existing customer and utilized it to create more value and flip what has traditionally been an expense into a revenue opportunity. So now, oh, I noticed that you like a white pullover. I noticed that you have bought this in the past. May I please excite you about something else? Then take it to the next level. And that is how do they recruit people to do this work behind the firewall of multiple multinational companies in a protected manner and attract people that want to work not from home, but work from anywhere. I come to you today from Tampa, Florida, on this live video stream. So this business has taken all of what we do naturally in advance and done it in a protected manner and understood customer patterns and then taken it to the next level, which is the ability to recruit people through all of the information in not only social media, media but digital media and attracting new employees. What does that mean? That means a value proposition for their customer base, which generates healthy margin, which ultimately creates a position for a monetization event for the three owners that founded the company. And so artificial intelligence is critical at the entire food chain of the life cycle of a business. So I'll stop there and just say that it's a, that is a component of how it bubbles up into the real world of financial transactions globally. Well, and just to add on to that, I, I think we I think we see it everywhere, and especially as we talk about even the five G, the accumulation. We're we're just getting so much more data. Uh, it's it's AI. It's it's not if we use it's how we use it and how well we use it. Exactly, absolutely. Well, we have a question from the audience, and it's a perfect segue to my other topic. Was about risk management and fraud. We have two with us that are fantastic, uh, uh, knowledgeable of this area. Uh, Sanja, uh, which, uh, you have quite an experience about third-party risk management and AI. And John, um, who has a point of view on regulatory environment and, and fair lending concerns in a way. So the question, I'm going to read it, is, is ML-based fraud detection system 100% foolproof? What kind of provisions do MLA's based fraud detection system have for contingencies? The floor is to you, Sanja. Go. Sure. 
Yeah, I can, I can, I can go a bit wider than that, and then maybe uh, I, I don't know, John, if you want to tackle the question particularly. So I think everything that we heard so far around customer effort reduction, automated customer experience, bots, twenty four seven ops through Salser digital strategies, like that's all really great. But at the end of the day, banks do rely on not just banks; any organization relies on vendors that will be able to deliver that on that vision. So with these massive changes, we are exposed to massive risks that if not mitigated properly, could be catastrophic uh, to any organization. So I, I think, um, and you know, pre-COVID, post-COVID, during COVID, all of that has really brought, a, brought to light that um, a lot of these things were kind of an afterthought. Like people didn't really pay attention to it as much as they're paying attention to right now because things have really shifted in the last 24 months or so. So things like supply chain, vendor concentration, fourth party risk management, information security, business continuity, vendor reputational risk are all now part of this elevated third party risk management process. So, and I think I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna say it and I'm sure everyone agrees with me, cybersecurity is the biggest challenge hands down for any organization. So as a result, we are seeing a lot more organization investing in cybersecurity resources, implementing uh, continuous training for their for their employees um, and their customers, having robust governance process and operational risk committees, while also closely monitoring their third parties, but also their fourth parties. So that's the complexity that we haven't uh, we haven't seen before. When you talk about money laundering and you talk about you know the vendors that are kind of responsible for that. Um, it, it is quite um, crucial to have that robust view of what your third party looks like, but that you're kind of expanding it to a whole different level where you're now looking at the vendors of your vendors and how they can potentially have a pull-down effect on your reputation as an organization. So there's a lot of different um, uh, a lot of different things that are going on where we are all trying to protect our customer and protect our data. Um, but this is kind of just the broader, broader world that we are looking at from the from the uh, procurement and the vendor governance perspective. So I don't know, John, if you wanted to chime in on on the actual question. Oh, John, you might be on mute. We can hear John at the moment. Um, I will, um, I'll add a little bit of a, while John gets connected, just a couple please. things at the macro level, the motivation to protect by human beings is stronger than the motivation to attack by human beings, which creates a global environment that we should honor and continue to represent as we deal with some really tumultuous times and the power of protection is far greater than the power of aggression. The second thing I will say, which is really important is the life cycle of acquisition in the technology space from a procurement standpoint is far shorter than the advancements of technology in the same space. And so understanding that perpetual impossible problem to solve is one that we all should be mindful of. Hundred percent. Thank you. I think I'm. I think I'm back. Can you hear me yeah. now? Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, Sonia, the 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 point you brought up is 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 very interesting. You know, there's you know the the two highlighted uses use cases that that Ling and Paul brought up. You know, Paul being speaking more to, to the governance aspect, and and Sonia, what you talked about is. You know, as financial institutions move to an off-premise tech stack, right, moving more more of their their tech to the cloud and the virtualization of infrastructure, um, it it necessitates and mandates that there is a use of machine learning to a certain extent to ensure cybersecurity. And cybersecurity and fraud go hand in hand. It, and governance is a good example of a, a binary use of machine learning where. Uh, for example, heuristics in an organization. Heuristics is 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 a means for from a security perspective to assess the day to day data flow of an organization, a bank, right? How many customers access the system traditionally on a Monday through Friday, right? How many how many transactions traditionally process based on externalities, um, holidays, non holidays, birthdays, um, you know, uh, shopping patterns. You know, use you know how are you you know you use of use of of, of credit cards or, or payment processing right is is pretty indicative. 
So, so the power of machine learning is, is absolutely fantastic because it allows for the consumption of a lot of this data, right? And, and allows for considerations of layers of additional cons, um, information to make determinations of anomalies, right? The question is, is, is it foolproof, right? I would say nothing is absolutely foolproof. But what it does is it identifies anomalies and patterns that allow for an acceleration of issues to a potential human. So the phase one of machine learning is, you know, consuming a lot of data, identifying an irregularity. Something seems out of sorts. They're not making a binary determination of good, bad. They're just saying, here's an anomaly. This re requires further assessment, right? And that's where the human comes in with the ability for the human to make determinations and contextualize, right? And, you know, a lot of discussions around, are around AI but we're in the world of a phase of AI, which is just machine learning, in my opinion, right? And machine learning allows a programmatic approach to assess these objective, um, more binary determinations, and then allows a human to come over the top. Sure, as AI becomes more sophisticated, you know, we start layering neural networks to replace this human element, right? This experience, this knowledge, this, you know, you know and I always say it to a, you know, a new entrant into the marketplace, how do you get to your position? Well, you got to spend 20 years in the industry, then you can get to this position. And unfortunately, you got to do the 20 years to get the background, the, the context to understand and make the appropriate decisions, right? There's no, there's no way around that. But AI is, is trending to shorten that and AI is going to eventually replace that. But for machine learning, you know, Paul, Paul highlighted a great example of fraud detection. Right. Um, it was an anomalistic activity where an abnormal amount of accounts were, were created. Right. So so for KYC, it's fantastic. But then you take into consideration how it applies to AML. Right. Well, AML is that more heuristic. All right. Here's a traditional transaction. Here's outliers. And, you know, for AML, it would require more of a potential human to interact before a SAR determination needs to be made. Right. So, so, you know, I, I think it's a great question that the presumption is that machine learning and AI are the end all be all absolute. But where we are today is it's, it's setting the stage for an evolution of getting to a true AI model, which I always refer to as a layered neural network, replacing that experience concept. Right. Um, but absolutely permitting us from a cybersecurity, from a fraud, from a governance perspective to do the job uh, uh, that a human couldn't do, assessing massive amounts of data, contextualizing it and saying, hey, this doesn't look right. Excellent, exactly right. Right. That's amazing. And it really comes right into it. Kemko, I'm gonna ask you as an operating investor uh, to share with us, because we have a question from the audience and thank you for all those questions and I invite you to continue sending it to us. Can AI ever be as creative as a human agent? We talk about AI being able to read uh, radiologist uh, images way more faster. Maybe, as John was saying, identifying the anomalies rather than what it is. Um, but the question goes, could they extend to art, administrative business? Could they take functions like CFA, CFP, CPA? What do you think? So I think, again, the, the rapid advancement of technology is an ingredient in the human transaction interaction experience. And so I don't think, I think like as we as human beings, we, we have incredibly powerful brains, but there's something that is, if we have any experience with regard to our full body self, there is an emotional soul that is really difficult to automate. So I think the one thing I would like to share with the audience is understand the game in which you're operating in your life and then understand what your other counterpart is doing, either friend or foe, and make sure that you're utilizing artificial intelligence to optimize mutually beneficial outcomes for both parties, whether, and I, and I wrote this down and these are the, these are the seven games that I wrote down that humans can oversee, but computers can automate war. Everybody turns a card over. My ACE is higher than your three 
Let's go. Tic-tac-toe, X's versus O's. There's a little bit of intelligence there. Checkers, a little bit more. Chess, a little bit more. Billiards, now we have to react to multiple moving parts. Croquet, now we can play a game and compete against one another and use the balls against oneself. And then to get really complicated, talk about global international conflicts with actually machines. Now we're dealing with some real complex stuff. So as you think about this, not just from an artificial intelligence standpoint, think about how it impacts the brain of the human being, but also their personal soul and understand what they're willing to risk and what they're wanting to get as a reward. Excellent, Captain. Wow. Sorry, can I just chime in for one second? Just to Please kind of hold you. on to that. Um, from the contact center experience, um, and, you know, I, we are, when it comes to customer I, I think it, it needs to be recognized that competing on price is a losing war. But competing on customer experience is how you retain and gain new customers. So it really is a customer experience play here. And while what Captain said, while um, AI can, can automate a lot of these things, you definitely still need a human component to it. So I think what we are going to see um, change is that, you know, what your customer experience skill set looks like today is not necessarily what it needs to be 5, 10, 15 years from now. You need empathy. Empathy is something that you cannot train, you cannot teach. You either have it or you don't have it. So a lot of customers will probably use a lot of AI to go through transactional types of discussions, problems, whatever needs to be fixed. But when it comes to really having a problem or a concern that it requires the emotional human connection, that's where you need to have a human doing that work. So is, you know, is, are, are humans going to be replaced by robots? I'm going to say no, not for a long time. I don't know if anyone disagrees with that, but I think the, uh, the empathy is the part that we still need to retain here as, as a very crucial component for any operations, any business. Thank you so much, Sanja. We have a comment from the audience that says at Patriot, we have been using AI to automate accounting transactions based on identified patterns, instructions. And then there is another comment from Pete. Pete we have witnessed several recent frauds in the financial space where staff members colluded with another internal or external parties. In a high stake environment, how big of an issue is corporate espionage and how AI plays on that? Could anybody help me here? On the first, on the first one, I can take that. Uh, just in terms of discussing how AI can step into a place of uh, an accountant, the CFO. I, I think it goes back to a lot of what John said, which is, is as much as we can kind of create and establish patterns, uh, one thing we're working with at uh, Patriot is uh, when somebody wants to use our accounting software, can they upload their bank transactions and can it automatically go into the proper categories? Uh, of course, not in and of itself, right? You may have bought beer at the gas station or you might have bought fuel for your service truck. Uh, but but if we can, if you can help us establish the patterns uh, and we can use AI to create some of those suggestions of those patterns you wish to create, then certainly we can take a lot of that routine uh, one or the other choice work and, and automate that. Uh, and I think that's something that we're seeing a lot of. But when people say artificial intelligence, I always think of somebody told me uh, artificial intelligence doesn't exist. It's all augmented intelligence. Uh, and I, I have found that to be valuable in my life in terms of everything that we have working with is is helping us to think uh, better. And ultimately, we have decisions at the end, which are usually very human based things, which humans desire to make. Exactly. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's important to think. Remember, we live within a firm regulatory construct. We conduct business according to what our prudential or, or direct regulators say we need to do they direct how we need to do it and they they and they and they come in and oversee our organizations or our clients organizations in a manner that's very objective here's an obligation did you fulfill it you know we talked about governance governance is rather binary sure the obligation is protect data and preserve the integrity of transactions that's great 
But as we're starting to creep into this world of fiduciary obligations of individuals, right? We're talking about CFA, CPA, you know, uh, CFP. These are these this this is consumer facing functions that that a, a human has a fiduciary obligation to fulfill. To what extent can they outsource the responsibility? Uh, you know, that's I think that's great debate. But ultimately, the human is the licensed and individual is the person who has the obligation so the human is then outsourcing this this component of what they're doing to a machine that if they fail that human is responsible right so so the the, the consumer facing consumer experience you know it, it's very very challenging um because there are very subjective regulatory obligations right the the regulatory obligations and i apologize i'm kind of probably jumping into the the other part right the regulatory obligations really drive how technology needs to work here, meaning that ultimately at the end of the day, um, you know, sure, a, a binary objective threshold, you know, did, did a nefarious actor access, uh, you know, a, a data a database, you know, that's that's one thing. And was there a virtual robot watching over that? But, you know, was a consumer harmed as a result of the action of an algorithm, right? You know, and, and these are really getting into really questions of, of subjectivity, right? What is harm? You know, what is bias? What, is, what, are, what are things that programmatically AI could, could harm not only a person, they could harm a subset of persons, whether they're a member of a protected class, right? And, you know, if an AI tool is left to conduct these fiduciary type or licensed human, traditionally human licensed type functions, right? The, the risk of harm is so great that at the end of the day, I think the regulators, whether it's the EU, the FTC, the Department of Commerce, state regulators in the U.S., they're looking at it and saying, this is great. But remember, here are your obligations and we're going to we're going to assess the output and ask you to reverse engineer the output to prove that you didn't do anything wrong. Right. So the burden is on the financial institution in, in a rebuttable presumption. Right. What what the. AI does creates rebuttal presumption. It's it's a presumption that it's done right unless someone questions it. And the challenge is how do you reverse engineer an AI determination on whether a human with certain characteristics based on race, natural origin, you know, uh, sexual preference, whatever these might be, that data didn't skew the determination and adversely impact that person and as a result prevent them from getting a home prevent them from, from obtaining employment, prevent them from accessing cash, accessing money, right? These, these are arguably, you know, and, and, you know, human rights, liber elements of liberty that are so intrinsic. So, you know, the challenge that we face and why we're here today is to talk about, great, you know, AI and ML have practical uses and here's a safe, but remember that the regulatory world is gonna say, go for it, use AI. But the minute we raise a question, you need to be able to show your math and show us how you got there. And we're going to presume it's wrong until you prove it's right. And I think that's going to be a huge mountain for the financial services industry to climb when it's using machine learning and AI and consumer facing for consumer facing uses to fulfill these human fiduciary obligations. Excellent point, John. Definitely. This take us to a number of uh, questions that I'm be, uh, receiving at the moment. And it has to do with the topic of ethics. Uh, absolutely. At what point? And we can frame ethics in many different ways. Could a machine learning act as a judge and be able to make a more less biased decision uh, or as a juror? Uh, or could the machine learning act as a decision maker when the, cat is, uh, the car is approaching and Google has faced this, is approaching a traffic stop and it's either going to crash into the front, the car in front, uh, and protect uh, a, a, their uh, uh, and injure their um, their uh, a, a occupants, or is is going to turn into the sidewalk, kill somebody, and protect their uh, and in that sense not injure but protect their occupants. Uh, but in financial service, let's talk a little bit about the uh, ethics around whether. We can use data science, for instance, to avoid customers from leaving us, whether we'll use data, data, data science or machine learning or AI um, 
to um, make decisions uh, on behalf of the institutions uh, that are life decisions in savings, payments, loans, and so forth, investments in some cases. Any comments from you, from the audience? The one thing I will say is um, in the Enron debacle, I think <laughs> it was Judge pa, uh, Stewart, I think it was Judge Stewart, your story that, yeah. uh, gave a great quote and i think he was uh, uh speaking to andy fastall when he said it and it was ethics is knowing what the right thing to do is not what you have the right to do wow um, i would add something i think uh, i want to go back to the original question from how ai actually started um, AI actually motivated by human thinking. They try to simulate uh, how people actually think in reasoning, but it's not no emotional part yet. So first thing, um, machine learning basically, everyone touched a little bit about that. AI include machine learning. Basically, the current state is basically, we look back history. So we predict, reference the future. At the real time, when you make decision, there is a bias because the past world, historical world, not exactly the same, the current situation and in the future. That's come to a second part for AI, how we are going to simulate human interaction thinking at the real time based on what really happened. So that's called basically real-time AI, how they can adjust this to self-learning immediately. So come back to the question, will AI can create art uh, and replace take over C CFA, C CFP? In some way, yes, but I don't think it's totally because I still think human mind human reasoning is still a key driver. So I'm coming back to the ethic part. And as far as ethic, all these kind of different roles, we can use in computer quantify that, that kind of roles. So we interpret it into numbers in a way machine can understand. So I think AI can do that. But it will take some time. <laughs> you know, Thank you. <laughs> ethics, Hiro, you know, Ling, I think that's right on and you nailed it, right? It, Hiro, the ethics is a construct. It's not an end result, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's a lens under which, you know, um, someone is viewing something and, and it, it, it translates to what's in front of them. So, you know, ethics is relative, right? So ethics mm -hmm. is a construct of assessing and making a determination of, you know, predefined elements as it relates to the intended use or the output, right? And, and, and the use, the, the discussion around ethics is not what are ethics, you know, the question is, do you have a process in place to assess what you're doing against societal constructs of what society finds important, right? Once again, mm -hmm. I talked about the human rights, the right to, to own a home, the right to access capital, you know, the right to employment, the right to travel, you know, these, these are, these are elements. So, you know, the challenge with ethics is, you know, like any good lawyer would answer it. It depends. It depends what we're talking about. It depends on how it's being used. It depends. It's directly relative to the nature of the use of the MI. So I don't, I don't think there's a clear predefined appropriate level of ethics. What's, what is applicable and what's not, it's not binary. It's not objective. It's so subjective. And, and all from a regulatory perspective, you know, ethics are being required. If you see the EU's um, EC that came out, the opinion pieces, um, the FTC recently spoke on this. They're not saying what to do. They're saying you need to understand how ethics relates to what you're doing and your use of this technology. And once again, we're not going to say what's appropriate, what's not, but we're going to question the hell out of what you're doing. Because if you're not, if you don't have an ethics officer, if you don't have an ethics process to assess what you're doing continually and show that you've done it, then we're going to knock you for that. We're not going to knock you for, you know, I mean, ethics violations, flags might question, allow someone to question the process. But when you're talking about, you know, a single ethics violation, 
and you're talking about algorithmic approach to decisions and determinations, you know, there's no such thing as a one-off in our space. It's going to be a holistic, broad brushstroke misfire. Um, so, you know, ethics are an important part of governance as it relates to adoption of MI, in my opinion. And I think that AI lends itself to some of those challenges, John, because obviously when we talk about banking, a lot of times we're looking at credit history, we're looking at failed payments, and then oftentimes we have corollary associated traits of those uh, of those individuals that society wants to make sure don't get lumped into some things. So I think what we've seen in the past is how sometimes we see a disparate impact on a certain population of people uh, that's resulting from a very logical AI experience, uh, but that our, that our government wants to step in and say, hang on, we, we want to make sure we're not pushing this in that direction. Responding to the customer churn question, I'd say AI is, is one of the absolute most important ways to communicate across the organization why we're losing customers. We have, we have people on the phones, right? At any given time, you can get somebody on the phone and they'll tell you why customers have quit. But you can't take that to the CEO and tell them that we've got to change all this because somebody on the phone complained. But when we can pin down a pattern of where we're losing people, when we can correlate end results based on customer experience, that's where we know where to focus attention to make changes that are going to impact that outcome. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. We are uh, just uh, 10 minutes away, away from finishing our conversation. Um, I would like to invite uh, the audience to share more questions as you have. Um, but uh, while we do that, uh, let me ask a final question to each one of you. Um, where do you see AI heading, especially in its impact in financial services? What are the either greater opportunities or challenges that will bring to the financial sector and banking in general. So either one of you, please go ahead. Uh, it will be great to hear from all of you, the panelists. I can go first. The definitely, I think uh, there is a great opportunities, especially for customer experience, automated, uh, I mean, make the automation more agile and have greater kind of fraud detection this area. Thank you. Excellent. I think one thing we're seeing a lot of is we're seeing AI being used a lot in the uh, kind of beginning stages. So we're using AI to bring in data. We're using AI to streamline the opportunities, but there's so much work to be done in terms of thinking intelligently about the best way to kind of revolutionize our use of AI. Uh, and I know there's a lot of ideas out there in the industry, uh, we see them taking uh, different ways, but we're still stuck on this. We're still stuck on this individual uh, bank sending money. How do we how do we make this kind of revolutionary in a way based on our new methods? We can move money in seconds. Uh, we we don't have a great way to validate people, but how can we? What what's going to be the new idea that's going to allow somebody to securely send money with protection from fraud in real time? And I have, I have not seen that yet from the industry, but I'm certain that AI is going to be a major part of that answer. Thank you, Paul. John? Short. You know, there's, there's two important parts, right? There's, there's adoption um, and there's, you know, defending use, right? So the biggest challenge the industry is going to face is adoption. Um, you know, financial institutions are heavily regulated, right? And they want to make the process more efficient. They want to reduce the human inter intervention that could potentially reduce um, errors, can reduce things that expose a financial institution to harm vis-a-vis uh, -vis consumer harm. Um, but then, there, then there's also, you know, crossing that chasm and, and adopting a technology that you're not comfortable with, right? Um, you know, they're, the, the U.S. regulatory regulators and some state regulators are offering sandboxes right now for great emerging technology, meaning that they're opening their doors for service providers to work with regulators to better understand how this technology uh, fulfills, you know, the common goals, right? Protecting the consumer, uh, reducing risk for the financial institution. And, you know, for, for, for anyone looking to adopt uh, emerging tech in any form, you know, they need the confidence uh, that it's going to work appropriately. It's not going to expose them to harm. So, you know, working with partners that potentially have no action letters, 
currently that available to the clients for use for control use meaning that the regulator acknowledges a certain technology as in beta phase and working very closely with the technology provider and that in the event that something messes up or something bad happens that the regulator agrees not to take any action or any adverse action against the the financial institution um so you know there are a lot of avenues for adoption but overcoming the the current you know adoption hump is going to be the biggest challenge uh, because there's a lot of fear about you know potential harm potential failures um and and you know and the whole you know we, we're a generation that grew up with skynet i don't know if anyone's ever seen the terminator series right mm -hmm. but you know i think skynet was our first foray into use of artificial intelligence and it still scares the hell out of a lot of people right you know the, the ceos of a lot of financial institutions you know might have watched terminator as a, as a youth and they're afraid of that's you know when they say ai that's what they think of right um it's true. Or, or odyssey 2021 you know 20 2001 so, you know, overcoming the adoption phase and getting predictable, um, you know, services available to banks and financial institutions, I think is vital. <laughs> Excellent, John. Who's next? I, I can just say 100% agree with what John just said. Um, it is that it is that initial hump that we need to get over. It's going to take some time. Um, but, you know, going back to the point that I made earlier, and I think a lot of pe people kind of get their back up against the wall thinking hey like are we all going to be replaced by robots like that is not that's not the idea here the idea is to have the transactional stuff move over to and get machine learning to take care of that and get humans to do more meaningful work that actually is required to be done by humans and i don't know that at any point we're going to have an ai that is going to have that emotional intelligence that humans have i don't know i might be wrong but i really don't think that we are at that point where we can replicate actual human emotion and empathy that I talked about earlier. Um, so yeah, lots of opportunity, um, a lots of uh, a lots of great things, but um, it is it's going to be an adoption um, challenge that that it's going to take some time to get us over that hump before we can go further. That's excellent. And Campbell? <laughs> no, I'm happy to share. Um, I'm honored to be in the room with all of you wonderful speakers. When we all say goodbye, and we all go to bed and we all close our eyes and we think about the millions of thoughts that fly through our heads all the time from, is my daughter going to hurt herself? Am I going to make the right decision? What am I going to have for breakfast? That is all intelligence in your brain. That is predictive and can be computerized what it makes you feel to piggyback on Sonia, I think is unautomatable if you can make that word up. And so what we need to do as a society globally is honor each other's hearts while recognizing our heads and understanding that advances in technology are critical and can be used positively, but let's keep it in that perspective. Thank you so much. Excellent, excellent comment. We just got a question from the audience. Too many security measures for the end users conveys the message that banks, financial enterprises do not trust the customers. How do they step, sidestep this issue without compromising the rigorous checks and regulatory environment that is necessary? Any thoughts? It's a problem. And anytime we're onboarding a new customer, I, I think the same with banks, it's know your customer is nebulous. It's impossible. Uh, sometimes you're married to somebody for years and don't know them well. My wife still surprises me at times. Uh, so in terms of how we kind of can streamline some of this, the way I've heard it done industry-wide is we put, we put customers into buckets. If we're able to validate your identity with this particular perspective, uh, you kind of get the green carpet, you're moving full steam ahead. If we have a little bit of orange issues, uh, okay, we're going to take some time. We're going to give you, we're going to give you good service, but we're not going to kind of prioritize our resources for you. And then we have people uh, that, that are not failing some of our automated or not passing some of our automated third party success things. And they tend to get the lowest level of service with document requests. Uh, manual verifications. Uh, and this is also a gray area where we talk about unintended consequences uh, that John was messing or message, uh, mentioning in terms of, hey, where do we have affected populations or or possible ethics violations that even though there's there's nothing programmatically impacting, 
we do see disparate impacts on certain things, which are contrary to values we've decided as a society. Uh, so it's 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 a hundred percent true. The the more we dig in, the better we create the security and try to identify you. Uh, the the more of a challenge it is uh, to actually get you onboarded, and that's very frustrating to people. You can go to some banks, have an account, and move a lot of money very quickly. Uh, and then on the other side of that, though, we we have greater risks of fraud and regulatory infractions. So it, it's a balancing test I think everybody is wrestling with. And uh, there's a lot of ideas out there, uh, none of which has been perfected. You know, I, I love this is a great question, and this is a pet peeve of mine, right? Adoption convenience, right? There's, there's a relationship here. You know, I, I, I went to file my quarterly taxes, right? With the IRS and I used a biometric, you know, tool ID me, right. Which, which allowed me to log in using a biometric snapshot of my face through my endpoint. Right. I wasn't worried. It was great. My user experience was fantastic. Some people might view that as onerous. People are afraid to have biometrics used in a day-to-day basis, but I tell you what, they're the first people to also go into Facebook and to use the app that, you know, because they want to see what they look like in 40 years, right? An app that takes a snapshot of their face, it goes to some app that's own, you know, you know, and, you know, in, in we'll just say Europe somewhere, right? Um, you know, and, and Eastern European block, right? Potentially, right? And, and, and they have your biometric snapshot because of your use of Facebook. These are the same people who say, I don't want to give the IRS my biometrics. Right. So it's it's overcoming that presumption of, you know, it's rigorous, make it easier and, and, and motivate people. Convenience is a huge motivating factor. So technology has got to get better to keep this from being rigorous and being it convenient. And Paul, I love it. You know, stick or carrot, use a carrot all day long. Right. You know, incentivize people, give them some sort of benefit and then normalize the use of biometrics. Right? Well, so- thank you. Yeah, go ahead, please. So I, I think this is a really customer experience. Basically, uh, this is a definitely a new opportunity for AI. Uh, I think how can we find a way we call digital DNA for customer to basically simplify this kind of security process? Um, this is I don't know what's the area. Maybe include that. A voice or encoding all pieces of information about a customer as some kind of code, only one step go through instead of ask all these kind of questions. <laughs> while, reaching to, while reaching to an end as a moderator, I have the last word or at least one of the last words. So I'm going to take yeah. advantage of that. Uh, I'm going to say that personally, I believe that the opportunities are huge. Uh, I've been an immigrant twice from Colombia to the U.S., from the U.S. to Canada. Every time I had to basically start over my financial background, my financial history, my interaction. So I consider myself basically an and bank and financial uh, individual every time I have landed into a new country. I believe this has to change in many ways. Immigration is a fact. It's happening. It's happening for a number of reasons, from conflict to opportunities, families immigrating, we have to be more inclusive in many ways. And what we have to do is probably collaborate, collaborate using machine learning to help us understand and take with us some of our history and our backgrounds and be able to be more within security, as John was saying. Um, We abuse some social media while we regret some other uh, um, uh, tools that are actually looking for us. Uh, And that's something that definitely has to change in many, many ways. I want to thank this panel. It's an amazing conversation. I think we all have brought uh, different aspects uh, from the investment side, operating, from risk management, um, from uh, IT, um, from data science. Uh, It has just been fantastic. Um, I want to thank you, and I want to pass it now to our host uh, just to give us some uh, final remarks. Um, and thank you to the audience. Great questions. Many more to come that we will have to do. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jero, John, Sania, Paul, Lane Kempton. I think it was a very interesting conversation which we witnessed just now. So just to wrap up, uh, we would like to thank our technology partner, Digit7, and all our community partners, speakers, and all the attendees who came together for enriching knowledge through this forum. It was really interesting discussion, which we witnessed just today. 
please log on to our website and like the social media channels. We'll be sharing lots of knowledge, sharing topics, details, announcement of next events and much more, which will help you register and attend the same. Just for your information, who have raised, who have logged on late, today's event was broadcasted in the YouTube and Facebook page of our company. So you all can go and see the recording anytime. There are lots more in store for subsequent months as well with focus on retail, e-commerce, factories, transportation, aviation, and we keep on adding the new topics as the month goes on. So request all of you to keep connected with us. Enjoy the learning. And all of you have a lovely day uh, ahead and take care. Thank you. Thank you.